Bibles, would you turn with me, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning with the 21st verse. Romans chapter 1, beginning with the 21st verse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. This is what America is doing today. America knows God. This nation knows God more than any nation on the face of this entire earth. But glorify him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This seems like the writings in present day newspapers. It seems like that you've just read it out of the papers that come from the morning presses of our big cities and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanliness. Now this is the sin of the age. The sin of lesbianism and homosexuality. The vile, rotten sins that's tearing America apart, apart my friend. The sins that God has damned more than any other sin ever committed in the darkened heart of man. It said to uncleanliness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women, the scripture says, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, notice what the scripture says. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covenous, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, whisperers, backbiters, lovers of God, hateful, proud, uh, inventors of evil things, disobedient obedient to parrots, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, knowing what God said about it, knowing what his word clarifies in dogmatic terms, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. I'm not preaching on this subject. Maybe Swaggart's old-fashioned. Maybe I'm out of date. But I feel that America went wrong as far as crime is concerned and holding it in check when she struck the laws against capital punishment from her books. I believe in capital punishment. You say, preacher, doesn't the Bible say thou shalt not kill? No, it doesn't. Not in that sense. It says thou, what the commandment that does say thou shalt not kill actually means in the root Greek, thou shalt do no murder. God gives the state and civil authority the right to take human life when that individual commits, commits premeditated murder, first degree murder. Man is not wiser than God, my friend. That's the reason God said they that do these things are worthy of death. I want to use for the subject tonight the ring of fire. Would you bow your heads? Father, tonight as I have had opportunity and privilege of preaching to this people for nearly a week, we've seen lives touched. We wish, oh God, that it could have been many more. We do not stand behind the sacred destiny depending upon our own limited abilities. But God, we depend exclusively upon Thee. I pray that You would overshadow us with Your might and power and anoint us with power from on high. We simply ask God, not for limelight, not for the plaudits of our brethren, not for the flesh to be, uh, its ego to be tickled and appeased, But, oh, God, we simply ask to hide behind the cross and to be a channel through which thy spirit may flow tonight.
that the souls of men may be touched. Young people may be warned of the error of their ways. We simply ask the anointing of the Spirit upon this. And everybody said amen and amen as we ask it in the name of Jesus. I preached a meeting in one of our great western states some years ago. God had moved mightily in the services night after night. The young people had been especially touched and moved. One day a beautiful young lady, 17 years of age, came up to me and said, Brother Swaggart, would it be possible that two or three of my girlfriends have an audience with you and your wife? I looked at her, a very lovely young lady. I said, certainly. Two or three days later, a Saturday afternoon, in fact, this girl and two of her young companions came to the hotel where my wife and I were staying at this particular revival in this particular city. For over two hours, I talked to those young ladies, beautiful girls. Those girls had been raised in that Assembly of God church. Those girls had never known anything but upbringing according to the words of Almighty God. They'd never known anything hardly but Sunday school classes, but the teaching of the Scripture going to church. But in these last few years, the last two years of their life, and especially the last 12 months, they had come under tremendous pressure. They had grown into lovely young ladies, grown as far as body was concerned. They had begun to rebel against many of the mores and the so-called Victorian attitudes that their mother and dad in their words were trying to push down their throats. The spokesman of the trio, this beautiful young creature with jet black hair hanging about her shoulders, she told me, she said, Brother Swaggart, if I live according to what you preached, and I live according to what the Bible says, she said, I'll be a wallflower. I'll not not have a friend. I'll not never know what it is to have a good time and excitement. She said, Preacher, I'm young. And I want to live. And I don't feel that uh, an individual, especially a young person, has to close themselves up and live like a hermit. And I cannot see any wrong in going to a high school dance, uh, providing it's properly chaperoned. I cannot see any wrong in uh, doing some of the things that you've talked against such as necking or smooching or petting or these things to use it in today's terminology. I cannot see the harm in a movie now and then and a bottle of beer now and then and she laid the cards on the table. She pulled no punches. Maybe, maybe you're right. But if I live the way that you say live, I'll never know enjoyment again. I'll never know a good time. I'll never know happiness. I'll never have any more fun. I talked to those girls straight from the shoulder. I pulled no punches. I laid it on the table. I wept as I spoke to them. And they wept as the spirit of God's conviction gripped their souls with eternal fire. That girl walked the floor. And at the end of that some two hours of conversation, she pointed her finger in my face and shook it under my nose. She said, I want you to know this. I'm going to live like I want to live. And live I will. I'm going to have a good time whether you like it my parents like it my pastor likes it or that Bible likes it I'm going to do what I want to do and turned and stormed out of that door weeping partly with anger partly under conviction as the Spirit of God dealt with her and it's never easy young people especially those of you that have known the touch of heaven to go against this book to ride roughshod over the Spirit of God to say no to the touch of heaven in your heart it's not easy to do it. And some two years later, while preaching a camp meeting not too very far away from the city, a young girl that herself had been going astray, and I had known it. I'd sensed it in the meeting. And she came to my wife and told her what I'm about to tell you. Those three girls, she said, Brother Swaggart, that came to talk to your husband and yourself, how that she knew about it, I did not know because I never related the incident to anyone. I considered the conversation private except between God and myself and the young ladies. She said that one of the girls that came up there that day had to get married, had 
had to get married the so-called proverbial shotgun wedding and she said her home is already broken up a baby into the world without the solidity and responsibility of a home to guide it the others already been married and divorced and that girl that pointed her finger in your husband's face and said I'm going to do it and I'll go to the dances and I'll drink my beer and I'll do what I want to do was killed two months ago coming home from a high school dance as her boyfriend inebriated drunk could not hold to the steering wheel lost control of the car at over 90 miles an hour wrapped it around an oak tree and that beautiful young creature never knew what hit her brother let me tell you something tonight the devil plays for keeps young people this is not just a sham not just a passing fad and a fancy Satan plays for keeps he wants to damn you to destroy you to steal you to kill to wreck to decimate to desecrate that's his business tonight and the saddening sickening thing is he's succeeding in so many cases today Many young people today, as they look at the terrible world situation, they might look in total hopeless despair and say, Brother Swaggart, there is nothing left to live for. I realize that many of you that sit here and listen to me tonight may not share those thoughts, but our streets are filling with young people at these so-called rock and roll festivals that are drawing 100, 200, up to a half million souls in one gathering. Young people that turn themselves on and thereby turn themselves off to the hand of a merciful God. They're saying, what's the use? There's nothing to live for. This world is sitting on a powder keg with a fuse already lit. Vietnam threatens to completely explode in a conflagration of hellish thermonuclear war at any time. Nothing to live for. Why are they in this terrible siege of despair? Do not misunderstand me. I do not share their sentiments whatsoever. I have no truck with a flag burners and those that would demean and bemoan the, this great nation of America. I do not sympathize with their annex. They are wrong. They are on their way to hell. They are defying the laws of God. They're on a path that leads to swift destruction and I'm against it. But why are they in this state? Why are young people today living a permissive life? where the sky is the limit live it up going to the depths of sin no no holes barred just go all the way anything that you're big enough to do and millions are bound but dope 12 and 13 year old dope addicts not isolated cases but it's getting in every school it's getting in every elementary school it's getting in every home this terrible living hell that defies all description why the horrid sexual promiscuity and young fists that brandish at the face of almighty God and they laugh at the very thoughts of church why is it possible that some ten years ago pleasure mad America embarked upon a, a, a siege of sin embarked upon a life of pleasure forgot God closed the old black back holy Bible throwed it in a corner somewhere to, to gather dust and mom spruced herself up and she put on her mini skirt and learned to do the frug and the monkey and the what to see and the jerk is it possible that dad threw the restraints aside and thought nothing of cheating on mom of doing anything he was big enough to do and marriage vows were just so many idle words and the hand was set up on nothing but to get more money more pleasure have a big time the refrigerator full of beer the cigarette stains on the fingers the dirty jokes that came from evil hearts God forgotten now I want to tell you brother this generation of youth has been raised in an environment like that I hate to be as negative as I am tonight but they've been raised in an environment of sexual lust they've been raised in an environment I forget God they've been raised in an environment when the book has had no place in national affairs they've been raised in an environment of sin of get mine of live it up forget God make all the sexual conquests you can make have a big time and the sky's the limit that's the atmosphere they've known. The double lives, the hypocrisy.
hypocrisy, the thin veneer, the facade. And God have mercy. And we've raised a generation of bigots, a generation of vipers, a generation of young people that have no regard for God, no regard for society, no regard for this generation, no regard for decency, respect, honor. And they say there's nothing to live for. The church has lost its meaning. And let me tell you this, you people that go to a good church and hear a good pastor preach the word of God, you don't realize what is happening and taking place. Most of the churches have lost all semblance of the word of God and righteous, decent, sensible living. They no longer preach the word anymore. You don't realize actually what is happening and what is taking place. But the church by and large in America has ceased to be a power in this great land of the brave and the home of the free. No wonder young people, after sitting in services where God had left many years ago, that no longer specialized in the word, no longer they lifted, no uh, fist toward heaven, no wonder, and said that God is dead. He does not live anymore. And nothing to live for. Nothing to live for. Therefore, live it up today. Therefore, indulge today. Forget about marriage. You can't expect to have any future anyway. Live it up now. There's nothing else to live for anyway. It's all going to explode in a mushroom and a holocaust in just a short few days anyway. But listen to me. Wait a minute. You young people that sit under the sound of my voice, I'll admit the conditions are not good. I will be the first one to admit that the black headlines upon newspapers do not speak good tidings of cheer or joy. I will admit that many times the parrots have made a mess out of things. I will admit that our government has taken wrong courses because they've left God out of the picture. But I am here to tell you that no matter what state that society may get in, no matter what the government may do, no matter what politicians may do, no matter what lawyers may do, or congressmen, or representatives, or senators, or preachers, or the mighty men, there is something to live for. There is something. You won't find it in a beer hall, twisting your hips, young lady, to the syncopated beat of modern acid rock music. You won't find it, young man, with a popping appeal under your tongue, or a needle in your vein or in the backseat of an automobile indulging in illicit sex. The emptiness will still be there after it's all over. The crying out for release and fulfillment and a thirst that's never slaked nor satisfied. But if you'll look through this facade of religion that many profess but do not possess, if you will look through the hypocrisy and the veneer of righteousness that tries to hide a cesspool of filth and sin and wickedness, if you will wade through it all, you will still find the Christ of Calvary lives tonight, and he satisfies, he fills the empty heart, he satisfies the sin benighted soul, he cleanses the life that's been stained and wrecked by the powers of hell. I am come, he said, that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Young man and young lady, he is the one to look to and he can still satisfy the thirst of a craving soul. One of the biggest weapons in the devil's grab bag of tricks today is the weapon of sex. The devil has used sex and is using sex as he is using no other club of power and strength to beat into submission and wreck and steal and destroy multiplied millions of our youth in this hour. One university chaplain asked Dr. Billy Graham some time ago, he said, Dr. Graham, in consternation, why did God make sex? He said it is 90% of every trouble, the cause of every trouble on every college campus and the majority of the high school campuses. Why did God make sex? Dr. Graham said, sir, God made it for two reasons. Number one, for the fulfillment of the marriage vows. And number two, for the propagation of the human race. God never intended for sex to be debased and besmirched and lowered to the animal-like level of a beast as it has in these last few years, my friend. But the 60s will forever go down in history as the black sex sick 
1860s that roared like a stream of gutter filth through this great nation of America. Sex was the big three-letter word that came flashing across every television set. And those smart boys on Madison Avenue in New York City, the advertisement geniuses of the age, they have used sex as the hottest commodity on the merchandise marts of this age. They're using sex to sell toothpaste, to razor blades, automobiles, farm tractors, clothing, uh, toothpaste, washing powder, and everything that you can think of today. And this generation has been fed a steady diet of sex. On television screens today, all you can see is young ladies, if you may use the term broadly, in an undress condition with every sentence with a double meaning and an innuendo attacked attached to it and you hear the the words that are filled with profanity this is the age our generation has been raised in but oh my god in this hour i want to tell you my friend and young man and young ladies you listen to me this night god said in his holy word that thou shalt not commit adultery god said in his holy word that fornicators shall have their place in the lake of fire I do not care today that this may be heralded as the age of the new morality. In the words of Billy Graham, it is still the same old immorality. And God hates it. And it is sick. And it is dastardly. And if you break the laws of God Almighty, you'll have to suffer the hellish, horrible, hideous consequences, for it is a ring of fire. Amen. And this permissive society demands an answer. Why is premarital sex wrong? Why? Young men and young ladies that see sex blackly advertised on every television screen, every billboard, every newspaper, the movies have become so sex-oriented that they defy all description today. They demand an answer. Why is it wrong? Why not indulge yourself? Those old Victorian principles of yesteryear have been done away with. This is the new age. It's the new time. A new page has been turned in the book of life. We don't think like you thought in the days of long ago. It's a brand new society and a brand new ball game today. Is it? Is it, my friend? Is it? Why did God say thou shalt not? Why? Did he say it because, as the devil might suggest, that he would want to withhold some choice morsel from you, young man? Did he say it simply because he's an old stingy God that's a little bit backwards, uh, that doesn't quite know what's going on in this up-to-date society? Is he a God that uh, hasn't quite caught up with what's happening? Does God just want to withhold good things from you, uh, keep you back from pleasure, uh, so that you'll have to withdraw yourself and live a monastic life uh, and shut yourself up in a den somewhere? To say you're a Christian, is that the reason God God said, thou shalt not. There are many reasons. Number one is the psychological reason. What do you mean by that, Brother Swaggin? This age has become the pill age of all ages. What do you mean by the pill age? Do you realize that five billion pills, five billion, I don't mean aspirin tablets, I mean pills that have drugs that are prescribed by, by physicians, pills that are supposed to pick you up, pills that calm you down, pills that tranquilize, pills that get you on the go. The major part of society today, without realizing it, they are becoming addicted to these pills. Call them a thousand different names that roll from our pharmaceutical laboratories today. And why are they taking these pills? Pills. One psychiatrist said the other day, he wasn't speaking in the realms of religion. I do not even know if he believed in God because the name wasn't even mentioned in his discourse. But he said, is it possible that we are wrong? That in our permissiveness and allowing sex to be heralded uh, to every desire, uh, to live it up, uh, to have a big time, to indulge yourself to the heart's content, uh, to throw off the old taboos of yesteryear. Is it possible that there is some type of mechanism uh, in the mind of man uh, that this permissiveness is to 
destroying? Is it possible this world famed psychiatrist said that there is some way that man is made in his chemical makeup that his system cannot stand this jumping from partner to partner? Is he tampering with the soul? This is what this man went on to say. One lovely young co-ed came to the chaplain in one great university some time ago. This is a perfect example. She said, uh, Reverend, I want to talk to you a little bit. Her nerves were jangled and all to pieces. She could not keep still. She said, first of all, don't talk to me about your God. I don't want to hear about church. I don't want to hear about eternity. I don't believe it. But she said, something is wrong with me. She said, I thought that when I set out on my new life to really live it up, to withhold nothing, to give myself completely. And I've had many partners, she said. I thought that I would really learn fulfillment and completeness then. I thought that when I threw my inhibitions aside and I indulged to my heart's content in the latest fads that are making the rounds of indecency today, I thought that I would know life in its fullness. But she said, I can't sleep at night. I'm going out of my mind. My nerves are all to pieces. I'm swallowing handfuls of pills. What's wrong with me? And my God, it's in every home, every university, every college. Millions of young people have gone the limit. They've gone further than the limit. But they did not find the satisfaction, the contentment, the peace, and the fulfillment they thought they would find. But they found a ring of fire. And a beautiful girl that's only a small shadow of what is happening in LSU in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, jumped from a four-story window and left a note and said, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. Do you realize the, the major age of suicides in America today are 19-year-old girls? Psychologically, God made you, young lady, to have one man and for him to be your husband. Young man, God made you to have one girl and for that lovely lady to be your wife. And you are flirting with disaster when you go another route. And then the disease factor. The smart boys thought when penicillin, streptomycin, and auromycin was perfected, they had the big game beat. They thought they was on the downhill trail. Man could live it up and have a big time. He would not have to worry about social diseases anymore, such as syphilis and gonorrhea. But young man and young lady, do you realize today that these terrible diseases and the world may, may try to make you believe that these diseases are no more than just a slight headache that you can erase with one aspirin tablet. They would try to make you believe it's no more than just a slight twins in your back. But these are diseases that burn, that sear, that canker, that go to the very brain of an individual. That you may think everything is all right. And brother, that is the reason that the doctors pick the baby up when it's born and slap it and cause the medicine to be placed in its eyes for fear that there may be a strain of social disease in your blood that may have made its way to that child and caused that baby to be blind. And I want you to know today there are millions of babies that are being born in America because of dope taking and promiscuity on the part of a mother that they are being born with their IQ at a terrible low level. They're being born at a disadvantage with something wrong somewhere. Are we breeding a, dis a generation of young people that are part imbecile today that do not have the capacity to think because of the sins, the sins of a mother and dad?
One sociologist stood over network television the other day and the first time an address of this nature was ever presented to the American public. And he said that social diseases such as syphilis and gonorrhea have risen to such heights in America that they have reached epidemic proportions. Do you realize that every two minutes, 24 hours a day that rolls around in America, a teenager, this is just limited to the teenagers. Every two minutes, a teenager is infected with a social disease like syphilis and gonorrhea. Think about it. And I want to tell you something else that touches me. There is a battle going on in America right now over the laws of abortion. They're doing their best to legalize murder. And I'm here to tell you that it is wrong, my friend. It is wrong. Abortion is murder. And young lady, if you think there's an easy way out, and God help America. We've already gone so far, I wonder if there's any turning back. But God help this land when we get to the place that we think no more of an unborn baby than we do an animal or a dog or a cat or a sow out here somewhere. You hear? me and this terrible thing is murder it's wrong it's sin in the eyes of God and my heart broke when I picked up the newspaper and this is not an isolated case and they found a little newborn baby lying in a ditch that had been born in the backseat of an automobile and a mother, had, if you would call her that, had thrown it out the window. There is no animal that will do that. There is no beast that crawls upon its belly on the earth that will do such a dastardly thing, my friend. The wages of sin, the wages of sin. And there are 350,000 illegitimate children that are born in America every year that rolls around. And do you know what they tell us? They tell us, young lady, that by 1980, if the trend is not reversed, that one out of every four babies in America will be born illegitimate. You think of this. When I heard that man stand over television and say that, something gripped me. I thought, my God have mercy. One out of every four babies born illegitimate. And girl, there is no hell quite like the hell of bringing a child into this world that doesn't know who its father is. Maybe you don't even know who its father is. No marriage vows there. No foundation of the home. You listen to me. The communistic rulers in China and Russia, the bear of communism, they would propagate every license in America. They would propagate illicit sex. They would propagate every vile sin. They would try to tear down the home. But the communistic powers found out 40 years ago when they tried to advocate free love in the so-called perfect society that it would not work, that the thing was coming apart at the seams. The fabric of communism was being torn apart and today the home in Soviet Russia is being propagated and built up as never before when the home in America is being destroyed in this hour and torn apart young lady listen to me you are a fool if you listen to the lies of hell and place your body on the auction blocks and give your very preciousness to the highest bidder until you indulge in a ring of fire and it burns and burns and burns. Brother Swaggart, what do we love each other? What if I love this young man and he loves me? This makes it all right. I don't really believe that young people in America actually know what love really is. Let me tell you, boy and girl, you don't know what love is until you've married that man or that lady and lived with him or her through thick and thin and sorrow and tragedy and trouble then you'll know what love is, and not until then. But we, we do love each other. It makes it all, does it make it all right, does it? Marriages are going on the rocks a day at the rate of one out of every three. And it's increasing at an unprecedented rate in this hour.
torn apart. Why? Because they tell us that one out of every six American brides, now listen to me, one out of every six American brides is already several months pregnant when the marriage vows are said and the so-called marriage knot is tied. It's already several months pregnant with child. I looked at a man and woman the other day and counseled them for over an hour in my office in Baton Rouge. They thought it was all right. We love each other. They'd already indulged in premarital sex. I knew it. You could see it on their faces. And that woman, I looked at her and I said, this is wrong. It's sin. You may go ahead and get married and think it's all right. But every time you're an hour late, that husband is going to wonder, where has she been? What is she doing? There's a mark there. There's a mark that can never, never be erased. It breeds jealousy that is tearing homes apart in the sour. And young girl, listen to me. There's something about used merchandise. You hear me? Something about used merchandise that is always marked down in value and never quite retains the perfection that it once had. They put used merchandise on the bargain basement counters for that one reason it's used. It's soiled. It's dirty. And if you allow that thing called virtue, character, honesty, purity, if you allow it to be squandered in the back seat of an automobile or a cheap motel room somewhere to the highest bidder, you are a fool, girl. And you're playing with a ring of fire. And boy, you listen to me tonight. God never intended for you to look at a girl like she was just a conquest to make, like she was just a piece of cheap goods. He never intended for you to look at a girl to, with one thought in your mind to get your hands upon her. He never intended for that. But God said for you to look at the girls like they are your sisters. This is what the word of Almighty God says. And this necking and petting and smooching and promiscuity that makes the rounds in this accepted society today is playing with disaster and flirting with death. The present music scene defies all description. The so-called acid rock of this hour that is being played on the top 40 stations is music that is inspired by the devil demon forces of hell. Art Linkletter stood before Congress just the other day with hot tears that stung his cheeks and addressed this great lawmaking body of America. And he told those people, he said, listen, dope killed my girl, it killed her. But he said, this music scene that's in every nightclub, every discotheque, every honky-tonk, every home almost in America, he said, parrots may not realize it in this hour, but the songs were their lyrics, are lyrics that are advocating dope taking that are advocating every filthy suggestive filth that the mind of man can imagine and my God the devil in this hour is using the entertainment medium young people it's directed at you the big beat that's filled with the demon forces of hell that has a meaning that wants to bypass mom and dad and go straight to the heart of the young person it's inspired by the devil for one reason and I'm going to tell you what it is the SDS, Students for Democratic Society, the Black Panthers, and a new group that's just been formated called the White Panthers. Some of these men are in jail today awaiting their release in just a few months, and some are out working feverishly. They have one thought in mind. They are going to tear down this society. They are going to wreck every school. They are going to burn every university. They are going to blow up every church. They are going to completely, till blood runs down the street corners, do away with this fabric of America in this hour. They tell us, and you listen to what I'm about to tell you. They tell us in just a few short years, and they are making giant strides today, that the sex act is going to be performed on any street corner in America with anyone that wants to look upon being able to do so. 
You hear what I'm saying in this hour. You say, my God, preacher, that's ridiculous. Did you ever think that you would come to the time in America to where that women would walk around so undressed that it would defy all description? You say, preacher, you mean to say you're going to talk about these men in skirts? You better believe I am, my friend. It's wrong. Girls, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. I'm not riding a hobby horse tonight, but I'm alarmed when the Catholic Digest can come out and tell the American people, I said Catholic Digest, and many of our poor Pentecostal preachers don't have sense enough to say a word about it, and they're afraid to open their mouths that somebody might say something about them or accuse them for being backwards or something. The Catholic Digest said, young lady, young Catholic girls, Whenever you want something to be advertised, you put it in the shop window. This is the term they used. And they said, if you're trying to advertise your body as bait, if you're trying to use it as a lure, if you're trying to use it as a sex kick, then you are succeeding. Because the present dress, the miniskirt, is aiding and advocating this as nothing else. And I'm here to tell you the Bible says, girls, and I'm talking to Pentecostal mothers, and the mothers are to blame. You hear what I'm saying? The mothers are to blame. My God, put some clothes on your children. And don't tell me today don't tell me that you can't find them in a shop somewhere I can't buy a dress my god I would take me a piece of needle and thread and sew some cloth on the bottom of them if I had to do it to be decent your bodies are temples of the Holy Ghost and I don't mean young lady that you have to look like a 75 year old grandmother I don't advocate that I don't believe God has ever found anything wrong, girl, with you looking lovely and neat and pretty and attractive. I don't believe God finds anything wrong, young lady, with you trying to make yourself more attractive. I don't believe he finds anything wrong with this. I don't believe it's wrong. But when you pass the limits of decency, you are flirting with disaster. And I want to tell you this, you can look as attractive and as neat and as beautiful and as wholesome and as lovely as any girl that ever walked the face of the earth and still dress decently and retain a Christian testimony in the Spirit of God in your life. One young television personality in Hollywood the other day, one that was one of the hip crowd and mixed and mingled and was one of the jet set in the modern society, was asked the question, what are your plans for the future? Handsome, striking, personable, his face flashed upon a million television screens. What is my future? He said, I want to uh, get married in the near future and have a family. I, I want to do this. It's time. They said, well, do you have any young lady in mind? He said, I'll tell you this one thing, this Hollywood crowd. I I don't have in mind. He said, they're all right to, to laugh with and to live it up and spend the night with. But he said, these that wear their dresses up to their waist. I'm talking about a television personality that could drink his whiskey with the biggest of them and pop his pills and thought nothing about living like an animal. He said, but that crowd I don't want. I want a girl that's pure. I want a girl that's wholesome, that can be the mother of my babies, where I can have a good home. I read that and I thought, my God, what a rebuke to the church crowd today. The music scene, and I know a little bit about it. My cousin Jerry Lee Lewis has been one of the, was one of the chief instigators of rock and roll music. And this SDS crowd, this black and white panther crowd, these militant groups, they say we're going to take over America, and the way we're going to do it, and our biggest weapon is rock and roll music. Rock and roll music. That's what we're going to use. You say, well, preacher, you play music with a beat. There's nothing wrong with rhythm. Every time we come to church, we sing leaning on the everlasting arms and clap our hands and, and praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with rhythm whatsoever. Moses and Myram on that shores of that Red Sea played their tambourines and shouted the praises of Almighty God. But I want you to know this beat that the devil today has nurtured and fostered is inspired by the powers of hell. And there are young people that are in these rock groups that are pulling off their clothes in full view of thousands of young people. 
and engaging in the sex act. And they're asked the question when police dare not step in with the air thick with marijuana smoke. They had one right near Baton Rouge the other day. A hundred thousand kids were there. The huge speakers that, that beat off the music as, as dope-filled entertainers and performer, performers beat upon the guitars and drums and instruments. And those young people that ripped off the clothes and, and acted like animals was asked the question, why, by reporters. They said, it's the music. It's the music. It gets down in you. It washes over you and beats upon your brain. And I really didn't know what I was doing, they said. I just pulled off my clothes and I had to do it. Inspired by the powers of darkness. And you boys and girls that have Beatle records at home, this is the most rotten, dirty, damnable, filthy, putrid filth that this nation or the world has ever known. And you parrots that would allow this filth to be in your home, you ought to be taken out somewhere and horse-whipped. You hear me? And I mean it, my friend. They're having sex, the sex instruction courses in our public schools that are becoming rampant all over America today. I saw pictures the other day of what they're wanting to show our kids. And I want to tell you this. If I ever hear of one teacher that shows my boy that filth, I'm going to get my car and go to that school and pull off my coat, and when I get through with him, his face is going to be rearranged. You say, you're a preacher. You better believe I am. And brother, the Christians would get up off of a chair somewhere and, and get mad at the devil and mad at the world and mad at sin and realize that we need to do something. We sit back and let the devil run over us. Young people, it's a ring of fire. Let me close. You say, preacher, way down deep in here. No one knows about it. I don't say it. I talk the opposite direction. A young man wrote a letter the other day that was high on dope and said, please, mom and dad, please, preacher, please, society, don't listen to what I say. Don't listen to me when I say I want dope or I want sex or, or I want to burn or I want to kill, destroy. Don't listen to me. I don't know what I'm saying. Way down deep inside, I long for that which is pure and holy. But the devil is making our young people believe today you can't live it. You can't live it. It's too hard. Too hard. Let me tell you, and I want to burst that balloon. It's easier to live for God than it is for the devil. Detroit, Michigan, the other night, I watched a girl on television, 14 years old, infested and infected and bound by dope. They asked her, are you going to quit? She said, no. Why? I can't. I try to. And the pain start right here. And they spread until I'm climbing the wall and I would kill my mother for a fix. If you think that's a good time, you're a fool. You're a fool. No, it's easier to live for God than it is for the devil. <laughs> I have a friend <laughs> whose name is Jesus. He holds my hand and he walks with me. I lean on his everlasting arms and I stand on his promises. And I wouldn't trade him for a million worlds, young people. Let me close. I'm going to have to leave out part of my message. Let me close. I've preached much in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been backstage quite a few times at the Grand Ole Opry, and I've talked to quite a few of the stars, so-called. I've seen them stand there and be late for their performance, talking about God with me. And I want to say this. I may be old-fashioned, but this crowd that will tell you today you can still stay in that show business and have God, they're full of the devil. You can't do it, mister. You're going to come out from among it when you get saved and give your heart to Jesus Christ. I stood at the back of First Assembly of God in Madison, Madison, Tennessee, the suburb of Nashville. 
Pastor Jay Alford said, Brother Swaggart, my telephone rung in my study and I was told that one of my families had had an automobile wreck. One or two people were killed. I went immediately to the hospital. Upon questioning, I found that the driver of the other car was a young lady by the name of Patsy Klein. He said, I went to visit her day after day, talked to her about God. And he said, I asked her, Patsy, what do you do? She said, her body swathed in cast and bandages. I'm one of the newest members, Reverend Alford of the Grand Ole Opry. And all Patsy had a golden voice. One day after visiting her, and Jay Alford is a wonderful man. He said, Jim, and I know him so well, he's an intimate friend. He said, the Spirit of God came into that room, and Patsy wept and prayed with him. And she looked up at me, knowing little about God, and said, Brother Alford, please don't think I'm fanatic or something, but I feel like I've just got saved. She thought you had to be in church or something to get saved. And he said, Patsy, oh, I don't think you're fanatic. You've just found eternal life. Jim Reeves. Cowboy Copas, Eddie Arnold, Marty Robbins, Hank Snow, the big names would come in to visit her, for they are a close-knit organization. And she would tell them, God has saved me. I'm going to live for the Lord. But oh, the devil, the devil. Her song that had just been recorded before the accident, entitled, I Go A-Walking at Midnight, caught on and shut to the top and made her a star. Her promoters were exuberant and excited and said, Patsy, this is it. All of her life, she told the preacher, I fought for this. I have wanted it. I've looked to this day when my name would be in lights and my songs in the top 40 or top 10. And I've got it now. And they put her in a wheelchair and rolled her from city to city on a stage for her to promote the song. She would close her shows with, I'd rather have Jesus or the old rugged cross. God was dealing with her, but soon even that went. There was nothing left. Catapulted, call it any name you like, to the top, that golden resonant voice thrilled the audiences by the thousands all over America. The name in big neon lights, the fast living, the partying, everything that went with it. God, I'm going to get right sometime. It was the last night. Jerry Lee Lewis stood in the wings, my first cousin. Patsy was the star attraction that night. They called her name into the screen. Of the thousands, she came on stage. This was her last song. She started to sing it. Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that is brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the turns that fill the tunnels, never falter, never fail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eyes upon the rail. Patsy tried the course and her voice broke, the golden voice broke and the hot tears stung her cheeks. Blessed Savior, Thou wilt guide us till we reach that other shore where the angels wait to join us in that land forevermore. There was no screaming that night. Something hushed the congregation. Patsy bowed her head for the musicians to play the interlude. 
And Jerry Lee told me, he said, I watched her when she broke. And she tried the second verse and turned and ran from the stage. The crowd filed out silently. What had happened? They didn't really know. My cousin, a backslidden preacher, that rock and roller, a backslidden preacher, walked to the door of her dressing room and her husband had his hand on her shoulder and Patsy had put her head on the table and was weeping and sobbing. He didn't know what was wrong with her. You're, you're tired, Patsy. We're going home. But my poor old backslidden cousin stood in that doorway and wept. And he said, Jimmy, he don't talk to me like this too often. Jimmy, the convicting power of the Holy Ghost was all over that room. He said, I wanted to run in there and say, Patsy, God's dealing with your soul. I don't know why. But he said, there I stood a rock and roller that had just sung a whole lot of shaking going on. How could I? How could I speak of God? They would have laughed me out of the room, and they would have, rightfully so. Patsy shoved herself up, took a glass of liquor, poured a, a drinking glass full, and turned it bottoms up to drown the conviction. A few hours later, she set with Cowboy Corpus and Hawkshaw Hawkins with a pilot in an airplane and my cousin Jerry Lee Lewis. She reached down and put her hand on his arm and said, Jerry, let the boys take the cars. Come on and fly with us. We've got an extra seat. We'll be in Nashville in an hour and a half. He said, Jim, or he didn't tell me this, his mother did. Jerry Lee told me he reached up and grabbed the rung put his foot on the step, flexed his muscles to pull himself up in it when something said, don't do it. And his mama told me that and fell on my shoulder and said, my God, Jimmy, you're the only one in the world praying for him that I know of. Please don't quit. Hallelujah to God. Wait a moment, sister. Let me finish this. Please wait. Let me finish this. And he stepped down and said, not now. Thirty minutes later, her dress was left in a tree, her body torn to pieces, the phone rung. Her husband, with tear-choked voice, said, Reverend Alford, have you heard the news? He said, yes, Pats is dead. Would you preach her funeral? And J. Alford said, yes, I will. He told me with his lips trembling and hot tears bathing his cheeks. I stood there, Jim, opened my Bible and preached. The casket was not allowed to be opened, but all I could hear and see was a girl lying in a hospital bed saying, Brother Alford, I feel like I've just gotten saved. Too late. Too late.